Thousands of years ago, nomadic peoples entered this land following animals and plant-based food sources as the age released its icy grip on the continent. The land flourished, giving birth to generations. Tribes arose and spread from the north to the south and from the west, eventually reaching the east, as the Laurentide ice sheet retracted and Ontario emerged as an island in the midst of this meltwater lake. Populations living on the fringes of the newly formed Great Lakes saw that they were teeming with life. Using the natural resources around them, they entered the deep and mysterious inland seas using only birch bark canoes and resettled new places. In time, legends were born of time and place, explanations for all things seen and unseen, the forces of nature, of life and death, of dream and wisdom passed on from generation to generation as they had become one with the land and recognizing both the creator and the mystical knowledge attained of certain geological locations and formations where power may be found and discern places to avoid. They had witnessed both magic and terror placing great respect on these places and creatures both of flesh and spirit. Creatures such as the Zabe, the Sasquatch, the Thunderbird, the powerful spirit bird of thunder and lightning, the Peguk, the skeletal winged creature of death, the Windigo, the cannibalistic spirit, the Shepeshu, the powerful underwater spirit, and the Mimigweshi. The Mimigweshi were known by many names by many tribes throughout the continent. From the Pukwudgie of the Algonquians to the little people of the Ojibwe, names used to describe their being range from Nibinabe, Mermen, to Memigwashi, to Memigwasi, Manigishi, and the like, to the anglicized river and nature spirits. These names could go on and on from tribe to tribe across North America. Around the Great Lake known as Kichigome, Lake Superior, Ojibwe translations range from ghost, to spirit, to merman, to even monkey. A fragmented literal translation of the word Mamigweshi equates to wonderful, as given by the Sodo Ojibwe minister Canon S.J. Sanderson, but couldn't translate the rest. It was found that the best and most accurate translation was rock medicine man which brings to mind thoughts and images of little red men dancing on the rock ledges. It is also interesting to note the Ojibwe word Bugwajiwininawag, the Sasquatch, features the same primary sound as the Pukwaji as heard in the word Bugwaji, which translates the wild. These creatures are believed to be an actual race of people, capable of magical acts such as invisibility, and the ability to pass through rock. They are also described as a type of nature spirit in the same vein as the fairies, elves, and sprites of European folklore. They are said to be little people standing three to five feet tall and some even shorter. They are purportedly said to have hairy, narrow faces, big eyes, sharp teeth, and adorned with two horns. Some speak of them having a flat nose or missing the soft part of their nose and a hairless countenance while Northwestern Ontario Ojibwe say they are missing their nose and only a hole is seen, leaving them ashamed of their ugliness. They are said to have long beards and are very old, with big heads, short arms, and standing bow-legged, and exhibit monkey-like characteristics. Those who have heard them say their voices are shrill with a nasal twang, and sometimes could be misinterpreted as the sound of an insect if it were not for their ability to speak. Some Southern Ontario depictions show them as having fishtails, suggesting they live and travel in the water, like the mermen and mermaids, the siren of seafaring folklore. They are said to have a diet of fish and often would steal them from nets. Native fishermen would find their nets cut rather than unraveled normally. In one story, some got tired of this and went to catch them in the early dawn. Being caught in the act of thievery, they headed back home, forced to pass by the stairs of the angry fishermen. 
They were said to have put their heads down into their canoes, ashamed of their faces. They are commonly heard of as being tricksters, sabotaging nets, boats, tools and equipment, and are said to even blow boats off course. Tradition says they travel in stone canoes. These canoes capsize boats where people are dragged to their deaths in heavy currents such as those found in whitewater rapids. Perhaps these canoes made of stone were actually rocky outcroppings which would pop up where the water level had dropped during certain dry seasons, which normally would be missed by those traveling the rivers and lakes. Ojibwe say they are to be left alone and should be stayed away from more than feared. At the same time, they are said to be shown great respect and will help if needed. If not given due respect, you invite them to cause mischief, misfortune, and on a rare occasion even death. It would be best to heed the warnings from the stories of old and make an offering of tobacco to them for safe passage. Many natives today leave gifts of tobacco on ledges or on the water for good luck as they pass certain rocks. Those who disrespected them should make a special offering of something that is important to him to appease them. One may have to venture into one of their caves to do this, even though most fear that place and avoid it at all costs. Some are said to live on cliffs and in river banks. They are said to be very strong, known to throw stones, move rocks, and able to push large boulders and people off cliffs. They are said to use magic to travel into the rock walls by large bodies of water and abide there. One native story makes mention of hairy-faced men who paddled their boats into the crevices of rocks along the northern shores. According to tradition, they are believed to live in shallow caves along the waterline and small fissures descending to the water. One native woman described them as an animal that comes out of the rock where the pictures are. A pictograph crossed from Red Rock, Ontario in the Nipigon Bay depicts a Mamigwaishi. A long-held belief from Galbe elders speak of a direct channel found directly below the Mamigwaishi pictograph that leads into Lake Nipigon. They are said to reveal themselves to children, tribal elders and medicine men. Spiritually gifted Ojibwe shaman are said to have the power to enter the rock and exchange tobacco for extremely potent rock medicine or special knowledge. Medicine men, the Midawiwin, record their dreams on rocks, painting abstract people and creatures in certain places to let others decipher and also to remember where the rock medicine men were to be found. These painted sites are sacred, associated with the spirits of the Mamigwaishi. When at one of these sites, one could feel the spirits of the past press down upon them, and sense the spirits of the Mamigwaishi watching them, like standing in a spiritual amphitheater. The medicine man would perform a conjuring ceremony and offer tobacco or prayer sticks for the little people in exchange for medicine. The Mamigwaishi are said to have been heard using drums and overheard with their paddles. One man's testimony states that his grandfather was alone chasing two Mamigwaishi who paddled right into a sheer rock face where a door opened and he went right through after them. A large snake was found inside along with an old man with a very long beard who asked him, what are you doing here? He replied, I want medicine. He was given the medicine and at once found himself outside in his canoe with the bag of medicine. Adapted from the Dudney Collection, 1960 to 1966. Some beliefs say they are benign spirits who lead other spirits through the Milky Way to the afterlife. As nature spirits, they are said to be invisible at times and can appear and disappear once again. They can create fire and use poisonous arrows. They are said to also brandish knives and spears for attacking people. Some are believed to live underground and take care of the rivers and the grasslands. These nature spirits are said to play entrancing music, luring children and adults deep into the forest to confuse and kidnap them. They are said to bring harm to people just by staring. Some say if you see one to never follow it, but to walk away. 
in some cases are even said to follow people home and cause trouble. If experiencing misfortune after seeing one, to leave food for them and not to look back, and this would dispel the problem. I had an incident happen to me actually just a couple weeks ago. I had my, I had my shoes outside. They were both outside and on, behind our, our gate. We have a gate on our door because we have two little girls. Nothing can get over the gate or even even move it because you have to move it from the from the other side. But my shoes, only my shoes disappeared. And everyone's shoes were outside. And which about I found my shoes. They were in the bush. There was one shoe uh, near the edge of my yard, going towards the bush. And there were the one was like this. And the other one was, and the other uh, about 10, 15 feet into the into the woods, and they were sh perfectly straight across from each other like that, pointing in at each other. And I believe that little people took my shoes and put them in the woods like that. And it, there's no way you can actually measure that out because it was about 15, 20 feet away from each other. The shoes, one was yeah, they were perfectly straight with each other. And I was like, there's no way people can actually do that. Like, you would need someone, you would need someone at one shoe and they would have to walk straight and do it. But, and I seen like, there was like a lot of little scampering for marks. I thought it was like animals, but when I look closer at it, there's a lot of little footprints actually going in all the different directions. What kind of footprints? They look human, like? Yeah, they were about this big. Little baby feet. Yeah. That and is I, weird. I was just like, I was like, and I told, and I told my girlfriend about this, she was like, I think little people have played a trick on me just now. And this was just two weeks ago. And this area actually is known for the little people as well. That's from what I've been finding out it is. And what you call it, the, there's a couple of gathering spots for little people. That rock is one of them. There's a tree in this area too, I heard. It's a dead tree, but I heard a lot of people, a lot of people, little people go in that tree and gather around it. It's like a gathering home for them. And the reason why people believe it's a little, ga it's a home for home for them for the gather is because there's markings all over that tree that we can't make. One sighting occurred on May 3rd, 1782, and sworn before the judges of the King's Bench for the District of Montreal. Voyager and merchant Vinal Saint Germain was returning to Michelle Mackinac from Grand Portage, had landed at the south end of Pie Island Thunder Bay, known then as Isle Pate along with three other men and an old native woman who needed passage. After making camp, they set down the nets for the night. Upon landing ashore once again, he happened to turn towards the lake and saw what he described as an animal standing halfway out of the water, its upper torso being that of a seven to eight year old human with his right arm raised and left submerged on his hip. It was such a strange sight that he and the others took note of it for three to four minutes. He ran for his rifle to shoot it and take the strange creature with them, but was stopped by the native woman who violently shook him from taking aim. The creature submerged, arms still raised, and disappeared into the depths. The woman reproached him for his audacity to shoot a god of the waters and lakes, saying they would all perish for this that they would be dashed to pieces against the rocks in a severe tempest. She ascended the steep bank and left the men. At about 10 or 11 o'clock that night, a gale set in, and they couldn't leave for three days. Eventually, they returned and gave statement. It is also worth mentioning that another voyageur passing Isle Pate had also witnessed the creature and learned that the area is known by the Sodo, that this is where the god of waters and lakes makes his dwelling. Adapted from the Canadian Antiquarian and Numistic Journal, Volume 2. In the 1980s, a local man went out fishing one summer day and had caught nothing. He spent the entire day at this little creek with nothing to fill his bag. When he finally had enough, he got up to leave when he saw a hand rise from the water. It beckoned him to come over. He left and told his wife about this strange occurrence. The next morning, he returned to his fishing hole in wonder of this eerie phenomenon, perhaps expecting another viewing or a lot of fish. Hours passed, and in the early evening, his family was worried for him. A family member trekked into the woods to find him on his fishing spot. They approached and found him floating in the pool. 
He immediately ran back to tell the family and the man's wife, who was befallen by that ominous feeling. In fact, she immediately made mention of the story that the night prior, that he claimed the hand had come up out of the water and motioned him to come back, and that she warned him not to go. My grandmother once asked my brother to come bird hunting, and he said as they came upon that spot, the dog started howling and barking and wouldn't come any closer. In fact, the dog ran off a distance until they left the area. Whether a dead man's presence lingers or the dog sensed a negative energy residing in that pool, that particular location remains a mystery. The Paleo Indians had first set foot on the north shore of the Superior area 9,000 years ago hunting caribou herds. As time passed, it is believed climate change affected local plant and animal communities and natives of the area began using smaller, more refined technologies such as spear points, hooks, gaffs, and sinkers as archaeologists have unearthed. At Red Rock, Ontario, at the mouth of the Nipigon River, there exist pictographs on the rock face made from red ochre and fish glue and possibly painted as early as 81,000. One of the paintings is thought to be of the Mamagwaishi. Natives on Lake Nipigon had a very old belief that the Mamagwaishi had an underground channel directly beneath the figure linking to Lake Nipigon and was the reason for these creatures being seen at Gull Bay with huge trout freshly caught from Lake Superior. Maybe the brackets refer to a tunnel and the bar in the middle shows the way through. It is also said that divers have actually found tunnels deep beneath the surface. To the north of Gull Bay is a large granite rock piercing the surface of the deep, reminiscent of Gibraltar. More pictographs are seen on what is called Echo Rock, across from Undercliff Island. The art found there may depict Mamagwaishi on boats, but most likely are bearded fishermen, which they mistook for the Mamagwaishi. These days, only smudges of red ochre can be seen while the rock exhibits more graffiti than anything. Also worth mentioning are the acoustics of these geological formations. It's possible that the original reason for the placement of these pictographs was solely based on the echoes of the site and were not understood and thought of as magical, as one could knock on the rock face and hearing knocks in return, causing a belief that men were living inside the rocks. Legend associated with the Red Rock pictograph states, there's a monster that dwells in a deep cavern below the water surface and the Mamagwaishi protects those traveling the Nipigon River from its evils. Legend, from the Nipigon Red Rock Gazette, Tuesday, August 2nd, 1994. To the south of Gull Bay exists a rock face where it has always been believed that the Mamagwaishi are found, a particular cave where old paintings were said to be, where stories passed down tell locals not to go due to the presence of the little people. So I'm uh, working on a documentary now on the little people you're meeting them. Uh, I'm in the place that, yeah, the stories from Gold Bay about them. But uh, Gold Bay has its kind of, yeah, you can sit here, you know, what it's like saying. It's like a painting, you know, painting, yeah. You can go in there, but you know, once you go in, you get lost in there. Because uh, when we used to go, like, canoeing or whatever, we were told to stay away from that rock. What was the reason why? Because you get lost. Because you get lost, yeah. Is it a, like a, a cave system or something? Yeah, yeah it's a cave. But the water is high now, you barely see it, you only see the tip of it. And there was a... Who the hell? Who was kid by me? I went in there. Yeah, it took a long time to find his way out. He couldn't find it. He couldn't yeah. find a way he went in. He tried to go the same way, he couldn't find it for a long time. And it wasn't that big of an area in there. I don't know, I heard the little people can't be trusted. And then if you were to ever in you know, contact with them, you try to get away, I would have to say it. <laughs> and you're a bad luck, whatever. You know, when I was growing up, they 
they told me if I was out past nine, the little people will get you. And I'll be like, you know, I stayed out past nine. And I uh, said, oh, there's no little people. They said, well, how come there's a big dolphin watching you? So what I figured, maybe the little people are shapeshifters. And then we just see all different versions of it. You know, because they say well, people were are shapeshifters, you know, they can, they know your fear. These water spirits are also said to travel on land as well, not being bound to water alone. One story was given that a man on Lake Helen, Red Rock Reserve, had actually seen little people in his house in the middle of the night. And yet another man says that in 1986, as a 16-year-old, he saw one of the little people while working on a tree fort. The sighting took place about half a kilometer in from the highway towards the mountain. While building his fort, he saw something run past him in the clearing. He said it was about two feet tall and covered in long, shiny black hair or feathers and quickly scurried by in silence several times. He was so frightened by the encounter, he didn't come down for hours. He told others about this and learned that the area had legends of little people. Older people in the town of Nipigon and Lake Helen Red Rock Reserve would say, don't go near the dog head, there are creatures there and there are little people living on the dog head. What he was told by his grandmother was there were little people living atop the dog head. The dog head is a small mountain arising from the Nipigon River on Lake Superior, where when viewed from the town of Nipigon, takes the form of a dog's head and snout. This mountain range connects to the Mamagwashi pictograph site across from Red Rock. One avid photographer and hiker also mentioned on the opposite side of the site, where they call Eagle Ridge, is a place where it seems to have a peculiarly strange feel to it, where it isn't hard to imagine the Mamagwashi being present, having a magical energy drawing you in. According to legend, the Nipian River's Split Rock Falls was formed by the Mamagwashi. When encountering an unexpected mountainous barrier, he raised his giant tomahawk into the sky and hit the barrier with such force it split the face of the rock in two. At Oxford House Band, a woman fell very ill and her family asked an old man named Mistus Magego to come and cure her. After repeated treatments failed, he said there was only one hope left, to go to the men who lived in the rock and ask if they would give him the powerful medicine needed to cure her. At once, he left and paddled his canoe down the Semple River to a large granite rock ledge where he knew they dwelt. The old man was very powerful and used his power to enter the rock. He conversed for a long time with them and asked for the medicine, and in the end his request was granted. He returned to the woman and gave her the medicine and it cured her. He said all should remember it was the powerful men who lived in the rocks who could give medicine to a powerful old man. He then mixed the paint and asked all the people to come with him to the rock ledge. They assembled at the rock and he told them how he had received the medicine and said that no one should forget the men who lived in the rock. He painted a two foot high stick figure and painted two lines stemming from the head like that of a rabbit. Now they would remember where the men of the rock dwelt and what they looked like and all returned home. The man who told the original researcher the story had heard it from his grandmother and her grandmother had been present as a little girl at the painting. Adapted from the Canadian Rock Art Research Association newsletter, Clint Wheeler, 1975. It seems to me the ancient stories arose to teach future generations, some to entertain, and others as a way to explain the unknown. Had they actually seen something? What if the stories of ancient men living in the rock were true? What if, at a time when things were simpler, more attuned to nature, these creatures held sway over the lakes and rivers, and their relationship to man was a reality? 
that there was something operating in nature that held a long forgotten knowledge of both magic and medicine that had diverged with humanity over eons. What has occurred to contribute to the longevity of a little people legend? It may be that there was something far more ancient living deep within the rocks and caves that revealed itself with the retraction of the glaciers and the first people stumbled into their territories. Something that really does demand proper respect. Uh, the story with the little people is, uh, if you see it, don't follow it. Because what you call it, uh, they're, they're, they're mischievous little people. They, they, they like to lure you into the bush and play tricks on you. We have a cave near Rocky Bay too that there's markings in it that uh, that there's uh, people don't believe that they're actual native write, writing. Okay. Like there's, there's something older. Right. And like, and near that cave too, that's where that cave is near. Is near that cave with, with, with the rock with all the little handprints on it, and each handprint's about like this big, probably. There's a cave actually just behind this mountain. I found it uh, one day. Me and my uh, friend were hiking around this mountain and we notice on, the, on that side of the mountain there's this little cave it's about uh, the hole is about the size of this rock here and he managed to squeeze himself in there and he looked around and he said there's a lot of little markings everywhere like scratches and stuff like and handprints everywhere like little black handprints and he said the biggest one was was this big and he said the smallest one was this big and like, I believe it was it was an actual den. He believed it was a den for them, like where they go and gather and give maybe give birth to more little people. Like that's what he believed. And like, um, when he, when he explained it to me, like I could tell he wasn't lying. Like, why would you lie about something, something going into a cave like that? Like, I believed him 100%. Even though I couldn't go in that cave myself because I get claustrophobic when I get into small areas. That's why he went in there. I couldn't go in. I, I could have fit in there, but I, I, I didn't want to. Right. Another thing too, I noticed, uh, uh, I used to trap in this area, which I called, I used to put uh, trap snares everywhere in this area because I used to get rabbits from my grandma. We used to make stew with them, which I called that one year, one year I stopped trapping. The re reason why I stopped trapping was because I was following the trails and everything, all the, all the rabbit snare trails. And then I noticed my snares weren't getting anything so I put the snares back up again put them in different spots and then I camped out there for a little bit and then I, I watched what you call it the this rabbit get caught I watched him and then what you call it as I was going over I, had to, I lost track of the rabbit so what you call it then I, as I got closer when I got closer to my to my snare it was empty like something freed it and I, I couldn't explain it like what, what could have did that? Rabbits don't usually get out of snares. They don't. Usually when they go in, they usually more likely they're going to die. But the rabbit stopped, like, he, like he stopped, like, the snare was on him. Usually when, they, when, they're, when they're running like that, they usually, when they go into it, it usually breaks their neck right away because the speed. But, like, it, it, like, he, the rabbit knew the snare was there, like, he knew to slow down enough. And he got caught still. And I, I feel like a little person was around that area. He told the rabbit that it's there, and that's why he's, I think that why, rather, why the rabbit slowed down. And he still, but he still got caught. But by the time I got there, the snare was was empty. Perhaps these creatures descend from an ancient simian-like creature, which adapted to life in the rocks and hunted the vast schools of fish found in the Great Lakes. To many, these were and still are real beings, tangible and ever-present. The human species as we know it has only existed for a sliver of time compared to Earth's history. We don't know everything that came before us and are still discovering remnants of prehistory. Maybe in its own way, magic still exists, not as we would imagine, but in a far more simpler way, the ability to stay hidden for their own preservation. Maybe part of that magic is the mystery Across the globe, these spirit beings exist in various forms and under various names, all bound to various geological formations, all exhibiting the same basic idea of size and mystery, though according to regional and cultural beliefs, each having their own individual traits. Perhaps the world goes one way 
and the Mamegueshi go another. But the legends remain, just as we have seen, and will upon occasion make themselves known to say, there is still magic in this world, if you are willing to believe.